saying, we're discussing the pastimes of Prahlad Maharaj, described in 7th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, and we're in chapter 9 where Prahlad is offering prayers to Lord Nishringadev to pacify Lord Nishringadev's anger, right? Do you get angry? <laughs> is it hard to pacify you, to calm you? Were you angry for a long time? <laughs> we hope not, right? So Lord Nishringadev was quite angry and it was Prahlad who was given the task to pacify the Lord and Lord Nishringadev was very kind to him. Lord Nishringadev had a lot of feelings for Prahlad Maharaj and he placed his lotus hand on the head of Prahlad Maharaj and by the touch of the Lord's lotus hands it gave him divya gyan and Prahlad was able to offer nice prayers, right? If I put my hand on your head, will you also offer prayers? Okay, we won't try. <laughs> anyway, Prahlad uh, was offering prayers and he was describing the, the nature of the material world, how there's constant troubles and suffering in every situation of life. Even for the people who seem to be very comfortable in life, they have troubles. Everyone is trou having trouble, so much anxiety. It's the nature of the material world. And even though one is blessed with so many opulences, nice education, good health, good looks, still people are suffering and in anxiety. And Prahlad Maharaj was describing how there's a wheel of time. Time is like a big Ferris wheel which goes round, you know, and if you... And the, the wheel of material life is like that samsara, we call it, the wheel of material existence going around, up and down in different species of life. And Prahlad Maharaj described... Mike is too close, that's what it's doing. Okay. All right. Uh, so, Prahlad Maharaj was describing that this wheel of time is causing, it's crushing him, he's being crushed, just like probably you've seen, I haven't seen here, but in India, they grow sugar cane, and you get the, the sugar cane walla comes, you know, and they have this, they have these wheels, they, they, they have this sugar cane and they bend it and they put it through these rollers and they crush out the juice. You know, and, the, you know, the sugar cane gets crushed, crush out all the juice, they bend it and bend it again and get every drop of juice out of that cane. So, we're like that. We also get crushed in the wheel of time. The wheel of time is crushing us, giving us a lot of trouble. So, Prahlad Maharaj was describing that this wheel of time is affecting those who have not taken shelter of the Lord because they haven't given any time and they haven't come to worship the Lord, therefore they feel crushed by the effects of time. But for those who are devotees and who have taken shelter of the Lord, then they're not troubled by the effects of time. They're free from that. So Prahlad Maharaj is appreciating this. Of course, he also says that he had the misfortune to be born in a demoniac family, and a family of Asuras, coming from the lower region of the universe. His father was a great demon. Aranya Kashipu, 
right? The name Haranyakashipu describes the nature of the man, that he wanted gold and he also enjoyed a soft bed. <laughs> In other words, he was attached to comfort and luxury living. So, <laughs> so Haranyakashipu had that nature, but Prahlad was of a different nature. Although he was born with that father, Prahlad had a different nature. He had been blessed. He had been blessed while he was still in the womb. He had the opportunity to hear from Narada Muni. And after coming from the womb, after Lord Nishringadeva appeared, Lord Nishringadeva had put his hand on his head. So Prahlad was appreciating his good fortune. And he, he's, he's, he wonders why the Lord gave so much mercy to him. The Lord never put his hand on the head of Lord Brahma or on Lord Shiva, and he never put his hand even on the head of his consort, Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. Why did he put his hand on the head of Prahlad? So we understand this was causeless mercy, kripa. See, there are different ways by which one can become perfect, you know. Usually we have to do sadhana. By practice of sadhana you can become perfect. Some people are eternally perfect. They're called nitya siddhas. They come from the spiritual world. They're eternally perfect. And others do sadhana and become perfect. And others may get kripa siddha. So the, these three different ways are there by which we can become perfect. And Prahlad was very fortunate that he got causeless mercy. Very rare to get causeless mercy. We would all like to get that causeless mercy. Uh, devotee Asril and Prabhupada, what does it mean, Kripa said? Prabhupada said, just like somebody comes and gives you $10 million, you know, and they just come here, take it. You never saw them before and they just come and give you this huge sum of money. Did it ever happen to you? <laughs> no, it didn't happen, right? That's Kripa Siddha, very special, causeless mercy. Uh, Prabhupada also talks about sometimes people get honorary degrees, right? Wouldn't you like that? You don't need to go to university. They give you the honorary degree, right? They say, come, we will give you on, just like Rabindranath Tagore, famous author from Bengal, he wrote beautiful poetry, and Oxford University called him, gave him honorary degree. Did you get honorary degree? No, neither did I. No. But that is causeless mercy, very rare, you see. You cannot expect Prahlad got that causeless mercy. No, Prahlad describes that he didn't want to get anything from the Lord because he knew that to ask for material blessings, it's going to be temporary. There's no purpose to asking the Lord for something material. You may ask him for wealth, you may ask him for fame, you may ask him for liberation, all of this is material. So Prahlad said, he didn't want these things from the Lord. What does Prahlad, what did Prahlad want to get from the Lord? He said, I just simply want 
to be blessed with the service of your servant. That was the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. Let me be the servant of your servant. Just like from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we learn that kind of mood. Lord, usually when we offer arti, before we do the puja, we should recite a prayer for our purification, right? Naham vipro, na charnara paritir, na pivaishyo, na sudro, na ham varni, na chagreha paritir, na vanasto yatirva, kintu projan, na kila paramananda purnam ritadbe, gopi bhartu padakamalayor, das, das, das anu das. Right? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches us that we should purify our consciousness. So especially before offering the puja to the deities, we should recite in that way. And this will bring us to transcendental consciousness. We should reflect that I am not Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Sudra, and neither am I sannyasi, or Vanaprastha, or Grihastha, or Brahmachari. I am simply the servant of the servant of the servant, many times the servant of that one Supreme Lord who is loved by all the gopis of Braja. So this is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mood. He's teaching us also, just as Prahlad, be the servant of the servant of the servant. Don't try to be, to go directly to the Lord. Mm. This is, the, this is a, the, an important point which comes up in Prahlad's prayers, the section of prayers which we're discussing tonight, that Prahlad Maharaj is pointing out that we have to go to the, go to the Lord through his devotees and not through, not, we cannot just go to the Lord directly. So therefore, when we worship the Lord, we worship the spiritual teacher. You can see the pictures of the spiritual masters are there, and we worship the Lord through the spiritual teachers. We offer, when we offer our food, we offer to the gurus, to the parampara, it goes through the parampara to Krishna. We don't offer directly to Krishna, we go through parampara. At the same time, we don't just worship Guru, we worship also Krishna. Lord Krishna is there and spiritual master is there. Spiritual master is the via media with Krishna. We go to Krishna through the media of the spiritual teachers. Prahlad Maharaj is teaching us this important principle. We want to understand how to approach the Lord. So Prahlad Maharaj describes his own situation. He said that he said, I was, I was bound by so many material desires and I was gradually falling into a deep dark well full of poisonous snakes. But my spiritual master, your servant Narada Muni, kindly came and took me as his servant and he taught me how to come to the transcendental platform. So Prahlad Maharaj says, how can I ever give up his service? I, I simply want to remain in his service. I can never leave his service. So this is the mood of Prahlad Maharaj. Prabhupada quotes one of the famous songs by Naratam Das. He says, Tandaran, Tandara Charana Sevi Bhakta Sanivas Janami Janami Hoi 
Eabilas, right? Is the is saying, let me have the service of the devotees. Let me live with the devotees and let me have the opportunity to serve the devotees birth after birth. That is the mood of the pure devotee that they want. <coughs> they want to be with the devotees. They want to be the servant of the devotees. So we first of all become the servant of the devotees. And by serving the devotees, then we gradually can go on to become a servant of the Supreme Lord. When our service becomes pure, we don't go directly to Krishna, but we go through the spiritual teachers. And Lord Krishna stresses that to Uddhava also. He said, those who say they are my devotees, they're not really my devotee. But those who are the devotee of my devotee, they are my devotee. You have to be recommended to go to Krishna. Who's going to recommend you? That this is the purpose of having connection with the parampara. We approach Lord Krishna through the disciplic succession. Just like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was uh, traveling and he had come to Mathura and he went to see the deity there and he was dancing and chanting in front of the deity. Lord Chaitanya was just with his one servant and Lord Chaitanya himself began to chant and dance. And while he was chanting and dancing, at that time, another brahmana, an elderly brahmana came and began to chant and dance with him. And Lord Chaitanya was surprised. You know, just like when we go for Sankirtan, it's unusual if somebody comes and also joins in. You know, people may look, but they don't usually join in. But Ch Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was dancing and the man also began to dance. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu continued his kirtan for some time, and this elderly Brahmana man continued to chant and dance with Lord Chaitanya. So after Lord, Ch after Lord Chaitanya took this Brahmana aside and he questioned him, he asked him, you know, who, who are you? And the Brahmana said, Oh, I'm a disciple of Madhavendra Puri. And when Lord Chaitanya heard the name Madhavendra Puri, then Lord Chaitanya bowed down to the Brahmana. Of course, the Brahmana felt embarrassed. He thought, no, look, you're the sannyasi. He said, I, I should respect you. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained to him that because you because you have met with Madhavendra Puri and because you were initiated by Madhavendra Puri, so you are on the level of my spiritual master. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had been initiated by Ishwara Puri. And Ishwara Puri was like a god brother of, uh, of this, this Brahmana. This Brahmana had got taken initiation from Madhavendra Puri. Ishwara Puri was a disciple of Madhavendra Puri. And Lord Chaitanya's spiritual master was Ishwara Puri. So this Brahmana was a god brother of Ishwara Puri. So Lord Chaitanya respected the Brahmana like he respected his own spiritual master, Ishwara Puri. And this way Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained to the Brahmana why he was bowing to him. Of course, the Brahmana felt, you know, you don't have to do this. You are much senior to me. You're a sannyasi in the renounced order of life. I'm a grihastha. You are senior. 
But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained the position. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu could also understand that because the Brahmana was chanting and dancing, he must have come in the disciplic succession. Because without the connect connection to the parampara, he could not have an appreciation for the holy name of the Lord. Other people may chant the holy name of the Lord, but if they're not connected into the disciplic succession, they will not get the real nectar of the holy name. The mantras must be received through the parampara. Sampradaya vihina ye mantraste nishvala mata. That if you simply get the mantra without connection to the parampara, then it will not bear any fruit. So it's very important that one should receive the mantra through the parampara. Then you get the fruit of the chanting. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appreciated that this Brahmana had come in his own line and that was why he was able to also dance and chant with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So it's important to get the association, to get the right association. Just like chanting the holy name, there are many kinds of people who chant the holy name. Uh, I remember when I first became a devotee in, in London, at that time, it was, you know, more than 50 years ago now. So, but anyway, at that time, uh, there was a musical which was being performed in London. And the musical was called Hair. And in that musical performance, the, all, the act, all the people on the stage would sing Hare Krishna. It was part of the, the musical performance, you know, they chant the Maha Mantra and dance. And uh, Prabhupada heard about it and Prabhupada said, they will all benefit, he said, because they have received the mantra from our movement, from Prabhupada's preaching himself. They had taken the mantra and they put it into the musical. So he said, they will all be benefited with the chanting of the holy name. But, and, and actually you could see some of them did benefit, even I remember some of them would even come on Harinam Sankirtan with us in the streets of London. Although they were in the evening, they were on the stage dancing in the musical, in the afternoon they would like to come and chant with us in the streets of London as we did Sankirtan, some of them. Uh, but there are other people who chant the holy name who are not devotees, who have the mayavada, their motive in chanting is simply sayuja mukti, oneness. They want the oneness of the Brahman. They don't want service to the Lord. They want the oneness entering into that Brahman. So that kind of chanting, if you take the chanting from that kind of source, then that is like milk touched by the lips of a serpent. It will simply give poisonous effect. So we have to be very cautious where we take the holy name from. It must come through the authorized channels. Hmm. There are different purposes in practicing spiritual life. Prahlad Maharaj understood some people want bhukti, they want material opulence. Material opulence can mean even going to heaven and living on the planets of the demigods and enjoying the long life and the opulence there. And other people, they want mukti, they want that oneness. They're tired of the material existence, they're frustrated, they know there's no real enjoyment, they haven't found any happiness in the material world, and they want to get away from the material world. But they think of liberation, and that the only liberation they know is a sayujya mukti, 
which means merging into the oneness and giving up, at least they attempt to give up their individuality. Now that kind of pleasure, that is actually, there's no real enjoyment there. With bhukti, there's some enjoyment, but it's very temporary. You go to the heavenly planets, how long can you stay there? Lord Brahma also has to grow old and he has to also get ready to give up his body because the universe is not eternal. The universe is material. It's subject to annihilation. Right? Bhagavad Gita describes about how the material world is created and then destroyed. So everyone in the material world have to understand the temporary nature of their existence. And if you get mukti, you enter into the Brahman, into the Brahma Jyoti, how long can you stay there? Because there's no variety there, there's no activity, there's no enjoyment. Will you like that? No talking. There's no friends, just like if you go to the Buddhism. <laughs> yeah. you know, because I, I, I often travel in Buddhist countries like Thailand and also Taiwan, both Buddhist countries. One is Theravada, one is Mahayana. So sometimes, you know, sometimes young people, they think, oh, we'll go to the Buddhist monastery for the weekend, you know, and they go, to the Buddhist monastery and it's, it's quite fashionable, you know, get away from the world for a weekend, go to the Buddhism. And of course, what did he tell them? Don't talk to anybody. What are you here to do? Just sit and meditate. Let your mind go blank, right? And that's what they do. They sit. And they spend the whole day, you know, in the morning, sit there, and then, okay, lunchtime comes, they take some lunch, and, and then go back and sit down again, meditate, you know, don't talk to anyone, you're not here to make friends, just think of the nothing, everything is nothing, nothing is real, you, you're not real, the world is not real, nothing exists, and this is how you have to think. And this is the Buddhism. Oh, the, the world is not real, you are not real. And there's, so impersonalism is a little different. You can see Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra, we offer our respect to Prabhupada, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Pascha, two kinds of Lord Chaitanya, Goravani Precharine, we're preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat these two very nasty, philosophies, impersonalism and voidism. Buddhism teaches voidism, nothing, right? You are not real. Prabhupada said, okay, so if I take a break and beat you on the head, it's not real, right? <laughs> mm, that's the end of their argument. You know? <laughs> How can they defeat that? They're saying nothing is real. And then impersonalism, become one, enter into the oneness of the Brahman. And in that oneness, there's no variety, there's no relationships, there's no misery, and there's no enjoyment. <laughs> there's no enjoyment, there's no suffering, but there's no enjoyment either. That is the impersonal Brahman. So generally what happens is you get to that level of the Brahman, you may enter there, stay there for some time, and then come back to the material world. They will come back to the material world and take up some welfare activity, open a home for orphans, or open a school, or open some kind of food kitchen, you know, 
there was one Buddhist monk, he opened a museum, museum of religions, you know. He did austerities for 30 years, then he opened a museum about religion. Now, they don't know what is spiritual activity. They have no knowledge of spiritual activity. But Prahlad, he knows. And the Acharyas also describe, if you do other yoga processes, you do karma yoga or jnana yoga, they do the sadhana, they will do the sadhana for some time. But once they become, once they get their goal, they'll give up their sadhana. You do karma yoga to get to the heavenly planets, once you get there, oh, I made it, right? You don't bother to do any more sadhana anymore. Sometimes foolish people think, I'm initiated now, I'm already back to Godhead, I don't need to go to the temple anymore. <laughs> You know, some people have that, they think like that. We have to be careful, we have to teach people, you know. Initiation means the beginning, it doesn't mean perfection, but it's the beginning, we go, have to continue. And how long we should continue? We should continue eternally. I was, one, one, uh, our, one of our devotees in China was getting initiation and they had they bought these very nice beads. And I said, wow, these are very beautiful beads. And they said, well, I'm going to use them all my life. I want to have some nice beads. You know? and very, I thought, well, very good, very serious. You know? They had that kind of thinking. So, devotees, we do sadhana <laughs> eternally. We say sanatana dharma, right? The eternal religion. Just like Dhruva Maharaj. Now Dhruva Maharaj became perfect. He was a boy, five years old. He'd gone to the forest and the Lord came to him after doing six months in the, in the forest there, Bindu Sarova. The Lord came to him on the back of Garuda and blessed him. So Dhruva Maharaj had achieved perfection. But Dhruva Maharaj still desired association with the devotees. It's not that now I'm perfect, I don't need association. The more we are perfect, the more we will value association. The more we are advanced, the more we will want to hear and we will want to chant. It's not that, oh, now I'm, lib now I'm pure devotee, I don't need to chant anymore. Ooh. That is not right. If somebody thinks like that, that now I'm a liberated so I don't need to chant. Oh, oh, that person's got problems. So those who are doing devotion, they will continue the sadhana eternally. They're going to keep doing, they want to do it more, increase the sadhana as they go on. Not stop, not reduce it. And Prabhupada told us, I remember Srila Prabhupada, he, he said, when I was a young man, I gave up mating and defending. He said, now in my old age, I've also stopped eating and sleeping. But he was still chanting and hearing. And you can see even Prabhupada, well, he was leaving the body, devotee was there reading the shastras to him. And even a few days before he left the body, Prabhupada was dictating purports, trans he was translating Bhagavatam. So it was going on. It wasn't that, oh, I've done everything, now I'm per I don't need to do any more. The devotee wants more service, right? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I don't want wealth, I don't want, for I only want devotional service birth after De devotee does not even want liberation liberation is something selfish a devotee doesn't think about liberation it's not for a devotee bilva mangal thakur the great devotee he says whenever i'm chanting the holy names of the lord I see liberation standing with their arms folded, waiting to serve me. 
A devotee has no, no interest in liberation. Our devotion begins on the platform of liberation. But for the impersonalists, their goal is to get liberation. So some people want bhukti, they want material enjoyment. It's temporary. Other people want liberation. They want to enter into the oneness. But how long can they, can they stay there in that Brahma Jyoti? And we should understand that position of Bra entering into the Brahma Jyoti, that is given to the demons that Krishna kills. The different demons who were killed by Krishna, they enter into that Brahma Jyoti. Those wrestlers who were fighting Krishna and Mathura, Chanura, Mustika, different people, they all got impersonal liberation. And people like Kams and Sishupal and like that, when Krishna killed them, they entered into the Brahma Jyoti, into the impersonal Brahma. And so, why should you work hard to get that kind of liberation? That's what the demons are getting. Do you want to get the same thing as the demon? No, we want something more than what they're getting, right? We should want to get devotion. So there's bhukti, there is mukti, there's also siddhi, the siddhas, the yoga siddhas. Some people want the yogic perfections. That is also material. Some yogis have that power, they can walk over water. You know that some yogi, they will do great austerities for many lifetimes. They get the power, they can walk over water. Prabhupada said, you can go on the boat. <laughs> you, pay, you pay a few ringgits or whatever, yeah, and you can cross the water. So the value of their yoga power is just like that. Or flying in the air. Okay, now Air Asia is there, everybody can fly. Yeah. Budget airlines are there, right? So these yoga cities, they've often they've been achieved by modern science and technology. So it's not very valuable, the yoga powers. And people who get these yoga cities, the yoga, they often become proud. They become arrogant that they've got this perfection. And that is not good. So what is the real goal? Prahlad Maharaj understood the real goal is to develop his devotion. And how to develop that devotion? He said, I have to get the association of your servants. So Prahlad Maharaj described how Narada Muni had saved him. He said, because of my material desires, I, had fall, I was falling into a dark well. Like all the common people, they're all, they never think about the purpose of life. And they're, so they're like falling into a dark well. You fall into a well, it's very difficult to get out. We were on Parikrama, Brajamandal Parikrama, and you know, in Brajamandal Parikrama, and every morning you have to go out and go into the fields, you know, do your business, you know, in the field. So, this one devotee, he was walking through the field, and early in the morning, and some people were shouting at him and said, what, like they were trying to warn him. But he didn't pay any attention. He thought, oh, I'm not going to worry about, don't, bo don't bother me. You know, it was early in the morning. He wanted to take care of his body, you know. And all of a sudden, <coughs> fell in a well. There was a well in the field. The people, other people were warning him, but, you know, they had just dug, dug a well in the middle of the field. He fell in the well. So, it's, it's a big struggle to get people out of a well. It took several hours to get him out of the well. Of course, he was injured badly, quite badly. Somehow we were able to get him out, but it took him months to 
recover. And so material life is like that. And Prahlad Maharaj also described to his father, to Harani Kashipu. Harani Kashipu was asking Prahlad, what was the best thing you've learned from your teachers, Prahlad? And so Prahlad Maharaj then told his father that I have learned that people who are attached to material life are like an animal who's fallen into a dark well. It's called Greha Andakupam, the Andakupam. <laughs> so material life is like that. We get attached to some situation in the material world. You enter, you fall into the dark well. The animal falls into the well, you never get it out, right? If the animal falls into the well, it's very difficult to get an animal out. It's so much trouble, you know. Just to get a human out is not easy. What to speak to get an animal out of the well? So material life is like that. And Prahlad Maharaj told his father that I've learned that one who is in that situation, they should go to the forest. They should go into the forest. They should, in other words, they should renounce the world and go and live in the forest. Vanna prasta except the re renunciation from the material world. Actually, the Vedas prescribe everyone should do this. The, the system is pancha sorvam vanambrajit. From the age of 50, the Vedas say. 50 means half the life is over. You may, you hope, we hope you can live 100 years, right? So half the life means 50. So the, prob the thing is we've been living in the material world and we get attached. We have a nice home, we have a nice wife, we have beautiful children and everything, but it's all temporary. We have to prepare for the future, for the next life. And so it takes time because naturally you get comfortable, you get attached. And we have to prepare ourselves to detach. If you don't, then it's very painful. When we have to leave the world, then it's very painful. But if you prepared yourself, then it's not so difficult. So Prahlad Maharaj is ex was explaining to his father. That this is what I learned from my teachers. <laughs> Of course, Harani Kashipu didn't like that, you know. He thought, what kind of teachers are that? And he got the teachers. He said, why you taught this to my boys? And the teacher said, no, we didn't teach him. No. It was his other teacher, you see. Prahlad had already another teacher. Before he met the, the two sons of Sukracharya, Prahlad had already learned from Narada Muni. So he was, <laughs> he was not lying, he was telling the truth. But it wasn't pleasing to the father. Materialistic fathers, they want, you know, you should do well, you should do good in the exams, go on and study, get a good job, make a lot of money, right? go in the same well which I am in. <laughs> I'm in the well, you should also come in the same well. You'll be in the well with me, right? <laughs> we should be in the well together. So, of course, devotees are not in the well. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is our ideal example of a devotee householder. And he describes how he says, Yedina grehe bhajana deke greheti goloka bhaya. That when I'm worshipping my deity in the home, then my home becomes goloka. So this is a business of family life, grihastas. 
You install the deity and you worship the deity every day. Right? The deity comes to your home, they become the proprietor of the home. It's not our home anymore, it's the deity's home. You bring the deity into your home, we are the servant of the deity. Gopi Bhartu Pada Kamalaya or Das Das Anud, right? Many times a servant. So you bring the Lord into your home, they are the proprietor, it becomes their home. And we are living in, in the home as the servant of the deity. Just like in Jaipur, right? Prabhu's from Jaipur, right? Ranchur Prabhu from Jaipur. So in Jaipur, everyone knows Govindaji, right? Govindaji came from Vrindavan. Rupa Goswami's deity came to Jaipur. And they came because Aurangzeb was coming. He was attacking, breaking all the temples and breaking the deities. So the devotees were very worried. They wanted to protect the deities. So they brought Govindaji and and Radha Damodar also came, and Gopinath also there, Madan Mohan also there. And after some time, you know, Arangjeb was over after the, the regime, after he passed away. Then the, the Brijbasi people thought, we want to bring Govinda back to Vrindavan. But the king of Jaipur said, oh no, he said, Govindaji has come to my home. I cannot tell him to go. <laughs> right, he's come to stay in my palace in Jaipur. He said, I cannot tell him to go back to Vrinda. And the, what the, the king of Jaipur did, he made Govinda the king. And the king said, I am the servant of Govinda. So that is the mood of the devotees. The, Krishna, Govindaji is the proprietor, and we are the servant of Govindaji. We have that, we have to have that mood. And you see, deity is not for our pleasure, it's for us to give pleasure to Krishna. We are meant to be the servant. So Prahlad Maharaj has that mood. He wants to serve, he wants to be this, he doesn't want anything material from the Lord. He just wants to be in, engaged in his service. So Prahlad Maharaj is teaching us all of these important points that we need to remember to be the servant, to fix ourselves in that nice consciousness. Any question? Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj, thank you very much for thank you very much for inviting this lecture and what I could understand is the importance of uh, what Lord Chaitanya but uh, I'm very much struggling with this mood, Maharaj. How I become servant of servant of servant of devotees is uh, is guidance how we can develop that mood. Well, I think you're very humble, you're a very good servant. I see you do a lot of service. It's very <laughs> astonishing to hear, you know, you're doing so much service every day, getting the devotees to chant the holy name, very nice every morning, and getting people to come together online and chant the holy name, very nice. And uh, I saw the deities in your home also. I saw, I could see the love and the devotion which you give them. So, of course, we should never be satisfied. 
we always want to do more. You should always think that I'm fallen, I'm insignificant, I'm not doing anything. And then that will keep us always uh, thinking how to expand, how to do more. What more can I do for the service of Krishna? So, of course, there's always a lot to be done for Krishna's service. There's always so many things to do, you know. <laughs> Devotees of the Lord are so busy, they never have enough time. You know, have so many books to read, so many verses to memorize, so many Vaishnava bhajans to sing. <laughs> so, and then the deities to worship and, oh, endless service. And so, yeah, that is healthy. That, that is the good mood. Of a, that's a nice mood of a devotee to think that I I need to how I can do how I can improve how I can do more for the service of Krishna. Very nice. So we encourage you keep thinking like that, and Krishna gives you the inspiration from the heart. Krishna will inspire you what to do. Just like Prabhupada got inspired to go to America and preach Krishna consciousness, Krishna does Kaviraj got inspired to write Chaitanya Charitamrita even in his old age. So Krishna will also inspire you how you can expand your service. Srila Jaipataka Swami Maharaj encourages devotees, study Prabhupada's books, right? Do Bhakti Shastri. The Bhakti Shastri course, very important. Before you get second initiation, you must study Bhakti Shastri. And then you can go on and study Bhakti Vaibhav, Srimad Bhagavatam. Prabhupada wanted all of us to study his books. So the best way to study them is to get in the association with other people who are enthusiastic to study. Just like you're in association every morning with people who are eager to chant the holy name. And you can get up at 3.30 in the morning or you're already, you start chanting at 3.30 in the morning. Eh? So the, the people have to have a good taste for the holy name. The same way people who are of a good taste, they want to study Prabhupada's books. You study Bhagavad Gita, that's a Bhakti Shastri, study Bhakti Vaibhava, first six cantos of the Bhagavatam. In this way, it, it, it's serious, you know, you get committed to study these things. Jaipataka Swami did these courses himself, you know, he studied them, he wanted to set the example for all the devotees. So it's very good for us to, to get in that mood, to study Prabhupada's books, to memorize the slokas, right? Just like these young ladies are memorizing slokas, right? Yes? They know so many verses, they know the, so many leelas. They'll remember their whole life as they grow up, they'll remember. So, we want to encourage this more and more. So, we don't just encourage devotees to read, but we encourage to discuss, make a group together, get people together to read the books and discuss. Don't just read only, but discuss and explain what you've been reading. That's very important. It's very nice to share whatever you've learned. Hmm? So Prahlad Maharaj was appreciating how uh, the Lord had come and killed his father. And he, Prahlad Maharaj told Lord Nishringadev that you did this just to keep the word of your devotees. Because Narada Muni had told Pro, 
Narada Muni had told uh, Kayadu, Kayadu was the wife of Haranyakashipu. So she'd been taken by Narada Muni. Haranyakashipu had gone to do a tapasya and she was pregnant and Narada Muni took her to his ashram. And she was worried that something, somebody may harm her child. But Narada Muni blessed her. He told her, your child will never be harmed by any of the enemy. And so it happened that although Haranyakashipu tried, and Prahlad also said, my father said he was going to cut my head off. And he had his sword, he was waving his sword. He said, I'm going to cut your head off and we'll see if this God of yours is going to protect you. And so the Lord came because the Lord had promised that he will protect, he will keep the word of his devotee. Narada had said, he promised Kayadu, your son will never be harmed by any enemy. And so the Lord keeps the word of his devotee. Just like in Damodar Leela, we see also Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva. They had to become trees. But Narada Muni told them, you will stand as trees until the son of Nanda Maharaj comes there and delivers you. So because Narada Muni had told them that, Lord Krishna had to come there to the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj and he had to have Mother Yashoda tie him up and then he could pull over the two trees and liberate Nala Kuvera and Manigriva. Lord Krishna is the servant of his devotees. The devotee made a promise to, to Narada Muni promise, Kayadu, your son will not be harmed by any demon. So the Lord came and he protected Prahlad, although his father was trying to kill him. But the, the word of the devotee is so powerful that it protected Prahlad. So Prahlad was appreciating how the Lord serves many purposes at the same time, right? He comes to protect his devotee, he comes to kill the demons. He comes to do many different purposes. He kept intact all the benedictions given by Lord Brahma. The Lord is so careful to keep everything. Everyone said Lord Brahma gave so many benedictions to Haranyakashipu. Lord Nishingadev had to keep all of these things in mind. So, so many purposes all served at one time by Lord Nishingadev. So, just imagine Lord Nishingadev was not pleased with Brahma that you gave me so much trouble because of you. So, not, not easy to be the Supreme Lord, is it? You could imagine how difficult it must have been for Lord Nishringadev to keep all of these different vows, these different considerations, they had to all be kept intact. But Prahlad was delivered, Prahlad was saved, no one could harm him. Kunti apriti janim hi? Right. The Lord promises, my devotee will never perish. So Prahlad was protecting. Although his father was ready to kill him off with his head. But Lord Nishingadev comes and saves him. All right. So Prab Prabhu wants to be humble. <laughs> He's the most humble soul already, but he wants to be more humble. Very nice. May Krishna bless you with more humility. So more chanting. It's always good. Chant, chant more. Then, and the more you serve, the more the devotees will bless you. Okay. 
Well, as I explained, you know, there is the Banaprastha, that there's a certain point you have to retire. You know, the children are going to grow up, they're going to get jobs, they're going to get married, and, you know, they're not totally dependent on you to do all of these things. You know, <laughs> most young people like to take care of themselves these days, you know, as they once they grow up, you know. And, may grow away from, go away from home once they grow go away from home they don't like to come back so much <laughs> become so used to being independent so you have to be thoughtful also about your own situation you're in the well somebody throws the rope we say hold the rope is it just get me out of the well Hold the rope, Prabhu, we'll get you out of the well. Just get me out of the well. <laughs> they don't want to hold the rope, you know, but they want to get out of the well. So it's often that situation, you know. We're telling you what you have to do to get out of the well, but we're oh. <laughs> I'm, uh. Anyway, it's good you're thoughtful, you're thinking about these things, and the more you think about it, the more you understand the need to hold the rope and get out of the well. You know, you can be pulled out of the well. We can be pulled out. If we're in the well, we can be pulled out. It, it's good to understand that situation. Often people don't realize they're in the well. You know, people are often, there's, Prahlad Maharaj also said, people are suffering, but they, they don't realize, they're thinking they're happy. And it's told also, one time, Indra got cursed. He was offensive to Brihaspati, and he got cursed to become a pig, right? And he was in the body of a pig. And after some time, Brihaspati came and said, okay, you come back now. Indra said, no, well, I, what do you mean? This is my home. I have my family here. I have my pig wives and my pig children. <laughs> I'm getting the pig, pig food every day. Farmers bringing me big buckets of food. I'm having a good time here. Right? He didn't want to go. He thought, thinking, I'm happy in this pig barn. And so Brihaspati said, oh, just wait. I'll get the butcher. So a butcher came with a big knife and said, where's that big pig, right? <laughs> So then Indra go, oh, okay. So when we're in crisis, then we'll get out of the well. The, you know, the more we see the danger, the crisis, then you make arrangements to get out of that well. Sometimes, it, it, when we're comfortable, of course, you, you, it, <laughs> you have a nice arrangement, you have a home, you have a job, and everybody's there, and they're nice. And Srila Prabhupada also had that experience himself, you know. Srila Prabhupada was thinking, I will do business, I'll make money, give it to my guru. But then his business failed and he lost everything. He lost, his business failed and then the family were no longer respectful and the home was no longer so pleasant. And he was trying to preach. But, the, you know, there was always problems. The wife wasn't interested very much. And even his books went missing, 
he lost his Shastra. So then he thought, I think it's time to go. So he got out of the house. So he saw this, he saw this was Krishna's special mercy. Krishna said, when I'm very merciful to someone, then I take away all their opulence. So in that helpless condition, then they can properly approach the Lord. They can properly take up devotional service. So it's... Uh, a little difficult if Krishna takes everything away. Sometimes they have to do that. But if you can give it up yourself, then it's better. You, know? you, don't, need to, you don't need to give up everything, but sometimes we get too attached. And then sometimes you have to make some arrangements. Anyway, in time, with time, you... you Think more about these things and make the necessary arrangements for your spiritual progress. Bilva Mangal is a nice example. We were talking about Bilva Mangal. He had a girlfriend, of course, Chintamani. And he was so attached to this woman that even in, when it was a terrible storm, he crossed the river and he, he couldn't get in. They had to climb over the wall. He held on to the snake to crawl over the wall. And he was banging on the door and she opened the door and, and it was a terrible storm pouring torrents of rain and he was soaking wet. And he said, I just want to see Chintamani. And she came to the door and she saw him and she looked at him and she said, if only you were so eager to see Krishna. And the name entered in and he thought, Krishna. It just shook him and he understood that, oh, this Krishna. And he turned around and left. And he, he understood this woman, Chintamani, was empowered by his guru to bring him to Krishna, to send him to Krishna, that she instructed him. And it made, it went to his heart. Although she was his wo woman, and she, it w was like a, a very amorous, loving relationship he was having with her. He was a song poet, he was a songwriter, and she would sing the songs. So he was very attached to her. But when she said like that, it went, it had a different effect on him and he just changed. And he left and he went to Vrindam. So you, we don't know what is Krishna's plan. We have to be ready to surrender. Okay, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. So many